League and More, and the more in League and More means we bring you not just rugby league, we talk to some of the greats in Gavin Payne. Mate, you've got a, you, you spoke to Lange, you spoke to Richo, who you got this time? Uh, I've got a steamed rugby league caller for the uh, both radio and television, um, John McCoy coming up shortly. Now, how many years has John McCoy been in broadcasting? A long time. Yeah, he's probably in for about 40 years, I think. We, we go right through from his early days, we talk about the Firehawks right up to the present and everything in between. He's got a couple of, we'll have a couple of interesting stories, I'm sure. He's one of the greatest calls of the, of the game and, um, and with four TAB, he's probably one of the worst punters of the game as well. But anyway, you, you can have all that. But uh, stay tuned. That is coming in, in the next few weeks. It is called League and More for that very good reason. And Payne and John McCoy will be coming on your stream very, very soon. Good on you, mate. Hello and welcome back to League and More. Uh, I'm joined this afternoon by esteemed rugby league media um, gentleman, Mr. John McCoy. John, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure, Gav. Lovely to be here. Yeah, look, it's, it's great to have you here. I mean, well, I'm going to just delve in over the course of this afternoon and just find out a little bit about what you're doing now, your history and your game, in the game and so forth and where you came from. If I can start with um, a, a very simple question, what got you into the media industry in this first place? It was funny, Gav. I, um, I always loved sport. I loved all sports and used to play as many sports as I possibly could. But I remember as a young kid um, of a Saturday afternoon, if I wasn't at sport and uh, was home and my dad was there, dad would always have the radio on 4BC, which was the, the racing station, and then 4BH, flick over to to George Lovejoy calling the, yep. uh, the rugby league. And on 4BC, there was a fellow called Tom McGregor, who was the studio man that sort of put it all together, um, all of the, the races, but all of the other sport that was being played. And I used to listen to Tom and think, gee, I'd love a job like that, you know, just talking sport. So I sort of set my mind to it. I thought I'd love to go into the media somewhere in a role such as that. And I also loved George Lovejoy, and I still say to this day, George is the best rugby league commentator there has been. Right. And I've, I've heard them all, but I stand by that. He was a brilliant commentator and a great showman. Anyway, I, uh, I was lucky um, that I was able to get a job lined up in radio even before I had finished school here in Brisbane. And it was with the Colour Radio Network, which was 4IP in Ipswich, Brisbane, 4LG in Longreach and 4LM in Mount Isa. And as soon as I finished school, I went, had Christmas at home and then went out to Mount Isa and had about 12 months out there and I absolutely loved it out at 4LM. Um, not only just a general announcing duties, but I was playing football. I, uh, I played minor juniors as they called it then, but it yep. was under 18. Yep. And I played for, uh, for brothers in Mount Isa we had a very, very good side. We won the Premiership that year. I made the, uh, the Mount Isa under 18 side. I had a couple of really good mates of mine that I'd been to school with in Brisbane. They were twin brothers, Terry and Dennis Keefe. And uh, Dennis, for a time, was the CEO of the Cowboys. Okay. But uh, Terry yeah, and Dennis yeah. were identical twins, lived near me in Brisbane. We lived out at Kedron. And they lived at Woolawan. So we used to spend a lot of time playing all sorts of sports together and uh, they happened to be out in Mount Isa, they're taking apprenticeships at the mines. So we had a year out there together. Um, I loved the football and the sport, but I loved the radio work. Got to do a fair bit of, well, no, I'd say a fair bit, a bit of commentary. Uh, they had a very good race caller and football commentator in Mount Isa, a gentleman called Johnny Moran, who uh, still lives up there in Corumba. Yeah. And uh, John worked for Mount Isa Mines and that was, he never wanted to go into the media. I always say, had he done so, he would have been one of the top commentators in the country. He was that good. But Johnny was a wonderful caller of racing and football. But when he had to be away, I could then do a little bit of, uh, of commentary myself. And so then I came back to, uh, to Brisbane to 4IP and they got the rugby league rights. Billy Jay was yep. the caller. Well, Billy and I had been together in Mount Isa. We'd known each other so well for so many years, even from our school days. He was a few years ahead of me, but at school together at uh, Gregory Terrace in Brisbane. So uh, Billy became the rugby league caller, but then I also got to call a bit of football 
the opportunity came up to go to 4BC to go into sport and do the job that Tom McGregor, the man that I'd idolised initially, putting all of the sport together of a Saturday. Yep. And uh, so that's where it started. And I had, uh, what about another 50 years doing sport after that, Ken? You mentioned um, George Lovejoy. Yep. Uh, I think George was the famous gentleman that broadcast a game from the rooftop out at Ipswich at the Ipswich, Ipswich football field. Did you ever have anything like that that you had to do? Look, um, I, I didn't get to call from a roof in, uh, in Ipswich as George did. But at a couple of unlikely ones, um, I always remember one time, it was the first year of the State League. And there was a very important game where Valleys played North Queensland in Mount Isa, of yes. all places. Yes. And Bernie Pramberg was doing the comments with me. Anyway, we went out and the broadcast position that they'd set, it up, set us up on was on the roof of the old grandstand right. at Crutchnet Oval. Um, the roof needed a bit of repair, let me tell you. There was a <laughs> few holes in the rust and corrugated iron. So anyway, they had a cherry picker to get us up and put us onto the roof, and that was okay. But there was only one bloke that could drive the cherry picker, and he had the keys to it. And when the game started, um, he went with a few of his mates and wrote themselves off <laughs> and came time for us to get down. I can remember Bernie Bernie saying, we're going to die. <laughs> we're not going to get down. But that was the game, in fact, Gav. It was the first time that certainly anybody in Brisbane had heard of Barry Gomisal. Right. Because he was the referee. Yep. And it was a most important game and it was a very tight game. And late in the match, a fight broke out. And Eddie Muller yes. was playing for North Queensland. Eddie had played under Barry and knew exactly what he did. He just let the play go on. Yep. <laughs> and he went in, ball was loose, picked up the ball and ran and scored, put it down under the post and Barry gives a try. All the Valley's blokes with, you know, Wally and all the good Valley side at that stage, yep. Rossi Strudwick as the coach, they were up in arms. But Barry just said, I'm here to referee the football. I don't referee the fights. It's a try. And North Queensland won a very important game. But that was our, our first introduction to Barry Gobbersall. We were hearing a lot about him. And later he is the grasshopper. And it didn't matter whether it was uh, State of Origin or the mm. under-7s, he let no, him play on, didn't exactly. he? Exactly, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned 4BC, where mm. you started your, your career. So from there, how did you go? You, you worked there well, for some time? Yeah, well, I had, um, I had a long time at 4BC doing the, um, the coordination of the sport of a Saturday afternoon. Yes. The ratings for the Saturday afternoon racing on 4BC were phenomenally high. And I think it's... That was where probably, Gav, I made my name because you were heard all over Queensland, pretty yes. much all over Australia. And in those days, with no television coverage of the races, what you said went. If you said, they're the numbers on a race and there's correct weight, bookmakers all over the, the countryside okay. paid out. Yeah, so right. it was a pretty pressurised job, but I loved it. I loved every minute of it. And in those days as well, there there wasn't the proliferation of races there are today. There was Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. We do a couple of races, say, from the Gold Coast. But you had a lot of time to fill in all of the other sports. Yep. And, uh, and that was probably my forte as well, being able to, uh, to do that. But at that stage, 4IP had the rugby league rights. And there used to be one game played of a Saturday afternoon. And the rest, of course, were played Sundays. Yes. The funny thing was that Ron McAuliffe, the rugby league boss, was a, just a fanatical 4BC listener because he loved the races. Right. And he always wanted 4BC to broadcast the football. But we said, look, we can't. We've got racing of a Saturday and nothing's going to interfere with that. And he rang one day and he said, myself and my boss and my great mate, Vince Curry, who was just such a wonderful mentor to me, um, he said, I'd like to have a lunch with you. So he went down to his unit, in fact, down at New Farm. He put on this lovely lunch and he said, if I move all of the rugby league off Saturday, no rugby league Saturday, all Sunday, would you be interested wow. in applying for the football? Well, of course, the football ratings were very, very good, yep. particularly Sundays. So we went back to our boss at 4BC and said, listen, here's the situation. He said, oh, we jump at the chance. So... I think it was a bit of, when I look back now, there was probably a bit of skullduggery, 
but then again, Ron McAuliffe was been a Labor Party senator and he knew what skullduggery within politics yeah. he knew it all. Oh. And he, um, when they put down for the new rights that were coming up, I don't think there was any mention of a proposed change. But we applied. I think 4AP bosses just assumed that they would get it. And all of a sudden, then the announcement was made. I remember it was one Friday morning. I was out covering the cricket match at the Gabba. And uh, the news came through, a bombshell announcement that 4BC had the rugby league rights and that all rugby league was going to be of a Sunday. Well, you know what I mean? You know, there was the uh, proverbial did hit the fan yes. over that. <laughs> but that's when I, uh, and the boss at 4BC called me in and said, well, obviously you're the rugby league caller. And so that's how I virtually became the rugby league caller in Brisbane. Yeah. Senator Ron McAuliffe had uh, a fair influence over a lot of things. And <laughs> that did, was another he? thing that he, he, he obviously uh, yeah. worked his magic on. Yeah. And uh, look, it was phenomenal for us because having the racing broadcasts of yes. a Saturday, the ratings for which were so big, and then the football of a Sunday. I mean, the weekends, we just absolutely dominated. Unbelievable. Yeah. So... With 4BC, you started the, the, the calling there and then into television at some stage. When, what yeah. was the progression there? Yes, well, um, Channel 9 started doing some rugby league and they got the rights to do a game of a Wednesday night game in the state league. And it was the first time, it was played at Lang Park under lights, but the first time a game had been telecast live right. of the, the Brisbane competition. Normally... Um, it would be a replay of a Saturday or Sunday evening yep. of the match of the day. But this was done live of a Wednesday night, so it had a great viewing audience. And Channel 9 asked me would I come over and... It was for television only. There was no radio call. So they asked me would I come over and be the caller for it. And um, I, I did. And John Barber yes. was, my, uh, was the co-commentator. Um, and what a character he was. Um, Rod Morris also did some, uh, some commentary with me at, at that stage. But it was not long after that that um, my boss at 4BC, Vince Curry, got very ill and, and passed away. And it was sort of a bit of a void for me then. And the offer came to go to Channel 9 full time. But I still used to do Call the Football for 4BC of a weekend when I worked in television full time. Um, and then I, um, I started doing some. Uh, work for one of the stations in Sydney, 2GB, and 4BC used to take their call of, of the football. So even though I'd done television, and then when Fox Sports, when pay TV came along, Fox Sports asked me, it was during the time of the Super League actually, would I uh, do some calling for them? So I used to do that, but do radio as well. So there was never a time in all of those years, Gav, that I wasn't doing radio, even though I might have been working my main employment might have been television, yes. but I always was doing radio. So there was, and I spent the last, what, 15 years doing uh, the breakfast program for Radio TAB, which I uh, absolutely loved until my retirement just over about 15 months ago. Wow, what a career. And that, that career spanned obviously many decades. What, over that time in rugby league, obviously we're talking about in particular, um, can you tell us about some of the changes that you might have seen? Oh, Look, when you look back on, on the games in those days, um, and as much as, you know, they were, they were terrific, there were some such wonderful players, the likes of. I was just so lucky when I came along to have, be calling these young kids, and that's what they were. Yep. Lewis, Meninga, Miles, then, you know, the Langers. It was, it was great stuff, but I mean, the change today to fully professional football, and the, the, they're such incredible athletes, and the speed that the game is is played at. Um, it's, look, the, the changes have been absolutely astronomical. But, uh, but I, I always consider myself very fortunate, Gav, to have come along calling in an era when all of those young players yeah. came through and to be able to call all of their careers in their entirety. Um, the first, very first State of Origin game. I think, you know, looking back on that now, when it had been mooted for so long, that we should have a state of origin because New South Wales are beating us with all of our players. Mm -hmm. When it was eventually, when it was going to be tried, I know that you know most of New South Wales thought, ah, oh, look, it's just going to be a one-off. 
And I think that was just the most important game State of Origin won because, no doubt in my mind, had New South Wales won, that would have been State of Origin won and State yeah. of Origin only won. Yeah. They would have said, you've had your bit of fun. Yeah. It was a gimmick. It'll never last and that'll be the last we'll hear of it. Luckily, Queensland did win and the rest is history. Yeah. But so much revolved around what happened in State of Origin 1. Of course, and Ron McAuliffe had his fingerprints all over that as well. <laughs> that he did, I yeah. was I was watching an interview the other night with the late Tommy Rodonicus, unfortunately, poor old Tom. I mean, he coached me God for a couple him. of years out in, out in Ipswich yes. and uh, a lovely, lovely man and a, just a true rogue of the game, as we all know. Um, and he was being interviewed by on one of the Fox channels, I believe it was, and he talked about that first State of Origin game and he had a great mateship with Arthur Beats and I talked about yeah. this last week with, um, with Shane Richardson with Shane, as well. Yeah. And... Um, Tommy honestly believes that without Arthur playing that night, New South Wales would have won hands down. It would have been exactly what you said. It would have been a one and done. And um, we'll go back and we'll keep logging Look, you with your own players. You know, Arthur Beetson was, he was well below his best, as we know. He was playing reserve grade at Parramatta when he got picked yep. to leave Queensland. But everything revolved around Arthur. The first time that this legend of the game, a Queensland legend, had actually pulled on the Maroon jersey and played for his state. Yep. And I, I still remember, Gav, calling from the old Ron McAuliffe stand side and looking when the players walked out of that tunnel. And you could see them from where we were, see them coming out. And here's Arthur with that chalk dust, remember, yeah. all over yeah. the jersey. Yeah. And the <clears throat> roar that went up that night from that crowd. And I know people like Wally Lewis will say the same thing. They have never felt anything like the atmosphere yeah. of that crowd on that night. And even though Arthur, his best football was so far behind him, but he lifted that night. And all of those other players, those young kids, they just wanted to play and say, I've played with this legend in maybe his only appearance for Queensland. It wasn't, as we know, he did play the next year, not in origin, but in the, yep. the next year was also two on residential. And yes. then if one team, and that was New South Wales, had won both, the th Origin was the third, but he played for the residents in that. But a lot of those young players thinking, this might be the only opportunity I ever have to represent my state with Arthur Beetson. And they just lifted. I mean, they were phenomenal talents, but it was yeah. a bloke like Chris Close, man of the match that night, you know, and they just were unbelievably good. You're talking about that. has got the hair on the back of my neck standing yeah. up because it was such, a, well, they were such with, an important part of the, of the Origin concept. Yeah, with those, all of those players, Lange and, and, I mean, what a year it was for, for Johnny Lange, yes. a legend of the game here, but had gone to Sydney, played in a yep. grand final, you know, and then to, played for New South Wales yes. and then comes back and plays Origin, yep. the post-Origin for Queensland. All of those young fellas in that, Brad Backer, yep. an Easts boy, and, and Wally and Mel and... Uh, to them, this was just, you know, incredible yep. that they could be there playing like that. And that was the birth of origin. But a New South Wales one, that would have been the last we heard of it. Absolutely. Um, we'll take a break now, John. We'll be back in a moment on League and More with, uh, to continue our conversation with the legendary John McCoy. Welcome back to the League and More with John McCoy. Um, John, before the break, we were talking about the great Tommy Rodonicus. Um, there's a few little um, stories, perhaps, about some of the characters of Rugby League that you've, that you've got that you might like to share with us. I love Tommy Rodonicus, as we all did. I love the passion of the bloke. You know, he was do anything for New South Wales, even though he lived such a big part of his life, later life yes. in Queensland. But he was New South Wales through and through, and that's what Origin's all about, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. He was just yep. so passionate. You loved him for it. And uh, he loved Queensland as being passionate about their state. But he, he was just a wonderful bloke. It, what you saw with Tommy Rodonicus is what you got. You know, he was a real rough diamond. But what I liked about him was that a more generous fellow you would never find. If someone was in trouble and needed a hand, Tommy was the first to put his hand up, even though he himself was struggling. Yep. Um, he, was, he was a wonderful, wonderful fellow. But it was a different era those days. And I remember <laughs> always that funny story told. Remember that, that game, it must have been about 1977, I think it was, when it was a really tight series and they played a game at Lang Park and 
Queensland had led narrowly right until the last few minutes of the game. And it was Steve Mortimer's debut for New South Wales and he'd replaced Tommy. And Tommy was furious because it was only a couple of years beforehand where Tommy, as we remember, he'd won the Rothmans medal in Sydney. Yep. Photo on by the referees. You know, <laughs> how would Tommy ever get the referees, mates? Hey, bribed him probably. Uh, probably. <laughs> Captained Australia in an Ashes winning test match in that 73 kangaroo tour when Graham Langlands, the, uh, the captain coach, and vice captain Bobby McCarthy were injured. And it was the game at Warrington, it was in the ice, and the ground was so hard, players were getting cut by little slivers of ice, and it was terrible. But, but it was the Ashes decider. England had won, the Great Britain had won the first test. Tommy led them to victory. Tommy just never thought he'd ever be replaced as New South Wales halfback. And this young, quick upstart from Canterbury, Stevie Mortimer, takes his place. So Tommy was filthy about it. And I remember they were, they were staying at the Tower Mill Hotel on Wickham Terrace. Yes. And Terry Fernley was the coach of New South Wales. Barry Muir was coaching Queensland. Terry Fernley put Tommy and Steve Mortimer as roommates. <laughs> Tommy got in first. Steve Mortimer arrives. Tommy said, you're not sharing with me and got his, all of his gear and just threw it out the window <laughs> down onto Wickham Terrace and said, you find your own way. Uh, so anyway, Queensland were in front. Mortimer's replaced. Tommy comes on. He'd only been on a couple of minutes. He starts a, a fight with the bloke who was to go on and be, and they were great sparring partners on the field and in the ring, Greg Oliphant. Yep. But the bottom line is he got New South Wales home. They won by a point. Yep. And, but that was Tommy, you know, he just, yep. uh, he was an incredible bloke. But I always, one of the funny stories I always remember about Tommy, when he came up and he coached brothers in Brisbane for two years, yep. and <clears throat> the second of those years turned out to be his last, and things weren't going that well. He was having some problems, particularly with the board. The players loved him, but he wasn't getting on that well with some of the board members. And it was after that he went to Ipswich, and yes. so began the association with Elfie. Yep. But the night of the presentation, after his second year, brothers had asked me would I be the MC for the night. And Frank Mellett, Mousy Mellett, was, yes. the, was the brothers' president at the time. And Tom got up to give what was to be his farewell speech. And Tom thanked the players, but then took aim at the board and said, didn't get the support and he was backstabbed and didn't have the support he should have got. Yep. And he didn't miss them. And he looked, and I'll never forget it, Gav. He looked at Frank Mellett. He said, didn't have the support of the board. He looked straight at Frank, looked him in the eye and said, et tu, Brute. <laughs> and all the players were there saying, what did he say? <laughs> Frankie Mellett knew what he said. And of course, it was the famous line from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, you know, from yes. Brutus <clears throat> knifing Caesar. You too, Brutus. And... When it was over, I was laughing. I said to Tommy, where did you pull that one from? And Tommy, that gravelly voice said, Roy gave it to me. <laughs> Roy being Roy Masters. <laughs> Roy Masters, Masters very, of course. Very smart man, Roy Masters. He said, Roy told me to use it. I didn't know what it meant, but Roy said, use this, this will be good. So the one and only time I think Tommy Rodonigus would have ever resorted to quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> And, and probably had to write it down because yeah, he might not have remembered I, I, it. For sure. <laughs> oh, he's a great bloke. Love Tommy. Yeah, Love yeah. him. God bless him. Terrific. Um, story of John Barber as well. Was John there something Barber. there also? Another bloke that I, that I loved. Another gravelly voice fellow, Johnny Barber. He was a great character. Great character. And he'd been, you know, of course, at Redcliffe as a player and uh, as a coach. And when... The state league started, Rod Morrison and Johnny Barber were doing comments with me on that Wednesday night live game. Johnny always hated playing against Ipswich. He said whenever Redcliffe played Ipswich, it always ended in a bloodbath and invariably said, even though we had a good rugged side, you know, with the likes of the Tony Obsts and the, yes. you know, Pete Lees and all those, you know, the tough players that they had. So we always came off second best. He said, I hate it. I couldn't stand Ipswich, couldn't stand playing them. Anyway, this night, Ipswich happened to be playing. Elfie was playing in the game and JB couldn't help himself. And he made a, a, 
a derogatory comment about Ipswich, I can tell you what he said. People won't mind, and all of the, the people, and we've got plenty of East there with the, with yeah. the Ipswich connection. <clears throat> Absolutely. Including yourself, Gab. Yeah, got a bit of a connection there, <laughs> indeed, yep. I remember Johnny Barber said, ah, he said, Ipswich, he said, um, mightn't be the worst place on earth, but you can see it from there. <laughs> I thought, oh, no. <laughs> anyway, Hugh Cornish, the legendary Hugh Cornish, was the boss of Channel 9. The next morning, my phone rang at home. Hugh, he said, John, the phone has rung off the hook. Everyone in Ipswich, we've got a big viewing audience in Ipswich. Everyone in Ipswich has been on the phone to, uh, to voice you know, their criticism about. He said, we've got to make an apology next week. So the start of the next Wednesday night's telecast, I told Johnny Barber, I said, you, we've got to make an apology. So JB, with that raspy voice, comes on and starts. He said, oh, he said, I made some comments last week against me. He said, my old foes from Ipswich. He said, it was all just in jest. He said, Ipswich isn't the worst place on earth, but it is in the grand final. <laughs> I said, no, but it's live to air. I think it was JB's last commentary appearance. But he was a great... But the funny part, to win that story, Gab, just after that, he went down and took a coaching job for a short while with the the new newly created Logan Scorpions, yes. and then went out to uh, to Mount Isa to um, to coach Black Stars in Mount Isa, and he spent a few years out there and uh, on town. No, I think he might have been a town in Mount Isa. Anyway, yes. he was coaching in the Isa, so I hadn't seen him for a few years. Anyway, at the start of one season, Canberra were up to play a trial game and they played at Ipswich. I just wanted to have a look at a couple of players in both the Ipswich side as far as the Brisbane competition and Canberra in the, uh, the New South Wales Rugby League comp that I hadn't seen. So I, I went up and I just had a look at this game and they were building some new dressing rooms there at North Ipswich just behind you know the old grandstand and it was pretty much a construction area and it was there were no lights or anything on and I'd parked my car not far from there and I thought, oh, look, I'll sneak away, beat the traffic. And I was sort of making a way through the dark through this construction area when I hear this voice saying, Macca, Macca, and I thought, it can only be one voice. That's the one and only John Barber. I turned around and said, JB, haven't seen you. You know, you're back from Mount Isa. And he said, yeah. I said, and Ipswich, he said, I'm living here. <laughs> <laughs> and he was. And he spent... The last days of his life until he got very ill at uh, living at Chimera with the Nipswich. So, yeah, but a, a wonderful bloke, but a great character, Johnny Barber. Wonderful, great yeah. Character. I remember playing against him and um, those tough Redcliffe sides of yeah. those days. Um, Forrester Grace Pro is another one that springs to mind. Do you know, Gav, I've only ever been knocked out once in my life. <laughs> only once. I hope it doesn't happen again. But when I was in Mount Isa and playing under 18, and we were playing against Black Stars, and there was nothing much between the two of us, brothers and, and Black Stars. And Forrester, Forry was in the Black Star side. And this one, and we were pretty good mates. Yep. Um, but this one day, I, I was playing lock, and I was having a bit of a bludge on the blind, and Forrester knew it, he picked it up, and he ran straight up the, the blind side, and he was as tough then at under 18 as he was at any stage of his career. And you know he was yep. such a tough man, Forrester. Yep. And he just ran straight at me and straight over me and knocked me out. And they, they say I was out cold for, you know, a, a good 90 seconds, two minutes or something. And uh, he never, lets me, never let me forget it. You know, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, Forrest, every time you say Forrest, I say, yeah, only time I've been knocked out, it was Forrest. Thanks very much. No HIOs in those no, days, no, John. So a, wet, a bit of a sponge, a wet, wet sponge around the ears and back up and into it, I Absolutely, imagine. Absolutely, mate. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, just changing pace a little bit and get on to the local club here, the East, well, now Brisbane Tigers. Yep. Um, so memories of that and, and, and thoughts? Wonderful. I, uh, some of the, the best games that I called in the Brisbane competition involved the East Sides. Desi, a, a coach, when he'd you know, been at Wynnum, came back to, um, to Easts. But all of those wonderful East Sides with the likes of, you know, the Wayne Lindenbergs. Yes. And there were just so many of those, all of those, you know, wonderful players. Uh, gee, they had a good team. They were just a really exciting team to watch. I always loved calling 
calling any Easts game because you knew it was going to be really rapid fire, great attack, really good football. Loved it. And yeah, some of my fondest memories, those really good East sides, sides of the early 80s. And you would have called some of those in the 70s as well? You would have called yeah. some of those grand finals? Absolutely. Like 72, 77, I didn't call. I didn't call the Jeff Five field goal one. I was there that day. But uh, yeah, look, I, I always loved calling East. Whenever it came up, match of the day at Lang Park involved East. So you, you knew you were going to have a good game to call. Funny with that, you know, like there are some sides, you know, if you, you've got them, it's probably going to be a bit of a, a dirge of a game, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. just trench warfare. Yep. And from a calling point of view, they don't make for the most entertaining calls. But you always knew when the Tigers were playing, good game to call, particularly if you were, you were playing against a side that also had some great flair. The likes of, say, a Valleys with Wally or, you know, some of the good winner manly sides yep. of that era, you know, or, or like the West sides previously. When you get that sort of, those couple of teams, you're always in for a good game to call and it just makes it so much better. For, uh, for radio. If you were calling the game when Alan Curry made that famous tackle, <laughs> yeah. you would have lost your lollies, I presume? <laughs> Absolutely so. Yeah, no, look, they were great. I, I always enjoyed calling the Tigers. Wonderful. Um, just moving on to today, uh, obviously the Brisbane Tigers have got the bid in to um, join the NRL in, in yeah. 18 months' time as the, as the Firehawks. Have you got any, any thoughts around that whole process and, look, and that, that bid? Look, um, there's a lot of people who don't think Brisbane can sustain another team. Um, I think they have to have another side in Brisbane, Gab. I think the uh, the people of Brisbane, they're such great supporters of rugby league. They deserve to have a game here every week. And I don't think that you can give opposition codes any advantage. Yep. I think you've got to have a game here every week. So no doubt, I, I'm sure it can be sustainable. Um, as far as who's going to get the, uh, the go ahead, Look, I don't know. And it would really come down to the financials. And I think Andrew Abdo has already said that. And the NRL will go through the financials of all of the, the bid teams very, very closely. And that will be where it rests. I'm sure with the, uh, the bid for the Jets, the Brisbane Jets, who've now combined with Ipswich, and the plans that they have out there for redevelopment would be fine in, uh, in years to come. And it's a great rugby league area, and if they were to get it, I'm sure they would do a fine job. Of the other two clubs, with Redcliffe and now the East of the Brisbane Tigers as the, uh, the Firehawks, the one thing I would say about both of those clubs is that they are the two most professional and most financially viable clubs, and not just at the moment, they have been for such a long time. Yep. And that means a hell of a lot. They've got the record on the board of being both being very professionally run. You only have to look at the assets that they have, the very successful leagues clubs that they have, how they've been managed over the years. They are just the two outstanding clubs financially of the Brisbane competition. Yep. Yep. And uh, if either of them were to get it, they'd do it extremely well because you know that they will be so well run. Yeah, and of course the Tigers have the... Um process in place to upgrade the facilities and, and exactly the field so. and so forth here. Yeah. So again, that would be a positive also. So look, I don't know. It, it will really come down to the NRL going through the financials of, of all of the uh, the bid teams. But um, as I said, from, from the two bids that have come in from established clubs, they're the outstanding clubs and have been over such a long period of time. Yep. So you were very successful and very well uh, respected in the in the media industry. I believe you now um, have uh, pulled the pulled the microphone out of the socket, so to speak, and, and in retirement. What's yep. what's your plans? What are you doing in retirement, John? Look, I um, a lot of the fellas at, at Radio TAB they shake their head when I retired. Gav uh, was at the end of January, last day of January last year. Just at that stage, and my, my wife and I were about to head off on a on a mm. cruise we'd planned, which we were able to have, and it was fabulous down to Antarctica. It was great, but I remember at the time we were having a send off luncheon from Radio TAB, and it was over at the Story Bridge Hotel, and I remember making the comment saying, "Well, I'm pleased about one thing: we're going on a cruise that's going south and not north. I don't think I'd fancy going up to Asia at the moment with this virus." 
Little did we know that within a month of that, yep. when we got back, we got back just as the the world virtually was turned on its head. Yes. And what an extraordinary time it's been since. And all the boys at 4TAB said to me all the time, you picked the right time to leave. When all the sports stopped, you got to just be fun. <laughs> True. But no, look, I've, um, retirement's been great. I, uh, I don't miss the uh, getting up at three o'clock every morning, but um, it's been terrific. I try and play, my wife, my, my wife Carmel and I try and play as much golf as we can, which I love. Um, golf's not getting any better. The handicap's not coming down yet, but I love it. Um, and I, I take as much interest now in sport as I did during my radio and television days, with I suppose just one exception that in those days, I would have to make sure that I watched this or watch that or watch something. And, yes. um, and yeah, I said, I've got to see it because I'll have to talk about it. These days it's, oh, well, if I didn't see it, I'll catch the highlights or whatever. But I, so I can sit back and watch just as, as the average fella does. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people used to say to me, um, oh, you, you know, what a great job just watching and commentating on sport. And, and I wouldn't disagree because I wouldn't have changed it for the world. Of course. But you did watch things differently when you're doing it as a job and you're commentating on it you would look for different things as you would know. You didn't watch it as the normal guy he goes no. along with his mates and sit there you know, and can just enjoy an afternoon at the football or sit in front of the TV. And and what, I used to have to watch it differently yes, because it was my, my job and I really had to sort of know it very well to be able to talk about it and discuss it. So I, I can now be sit back, watch whatever sport I love and watch. And, uh, and I still watch a hell of a lot of sport, but just watch it yeah. as I would as if I was... Just your average guy yep. who loves his sport. Yep. Well, John, you've been a fantastic guest. Um, you've had a wonderful career. We're, uh, we're very pleased that you were able to come in and have a conversation with us tonight um, and share your thoughts on the game over, over several decades of, of your knowledge and experience in, in calling the game. Again, thank you very much for, for your participation tonight and all the best in your retirement. And I hope your golf handicap <laughs> picks up. you just got to get out and play more <laughs> well, regularly, yeah, yeah. mate. More than three times a week, four times a week, five times a week, whatever it takes. It takes. Good, Good on you, John. Thanks, Gav. Thank Good you. to see you, mate. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much.